Let's pray. Lord, as we continue in worship now, through the reading, the preaching of your word, we pray you'd attend with it the truth preached, Lord, your power. So come, Lord, we pray. Give us open eyes, ears that hear, hearts that feel the gravity, the gladness to be felt here. Give us hands that want to reach out and hold, grab hold of this, feet that want to run after this, because you've run after us. Teach us, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Death and darkness have now left packing. Nothing to man is now lacking. Satan's triumphs have ended. What Adam marred is now mended. The fall plunged man into death and pain, but now through Christ, life eternal we gain. Pluck the harp, sound the horn. Do you not know? Tis Easter morn. Crowded may his worship be. Praise the Holy Trinity. Hope has returned for man in his sinful plight through Christ's powerful resurrection might. Where is hell's once dreaded king? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Hallelujahs to Christ we sing. Today is a good day. It is a grand day, the grandest of all days for the Christian. You think, what about Christmas? Christmas exists for this day, for its purpose is found in the resurrection. To make much of Easter and the resurrection reality, we usually take a pause from our current sermon series, a little detour to focus, fittingly so, on the resurrection. But today we've no need to pause. You love how these things work out when they happen in the preaching schedule, because our very next text in Romans, the first six verses of chapter 7, are all about the resurrection. It's peculiar, but it's potent, and it ends with the Easter reality. But as we come into Romans chapter 7, I'd like to remind you that when Paul wrote the letter to the Romans, he did not write verse numbers or chapter numbers. We did that later on. There's a debate about when that actually occurred. Most people landed right around the 13th century that we added these little numbers for the verses, the big numbers for the chapters to aid in locating certain passages quickly and to aid in memorization. But Paul did not do such things. Now, these numbers help us in those reasons that I just mentioned, but they can hurt us in the sense that they can create a tendency in us that's unhealthy. An unhealthy tendency to see each chapter kind of as its own freestanding unit rather than just continued on in the flow of thought. And so as we come to chapter 7, verse 1 this morning, we need to remember that Paul has not left. He has not forgotten the first six chapters. Rather, it's coming next in his flow of thought. He has it all in mind. So in that light, look back at Romans chapter 6, verse 14. He said back then, For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. From that moment on, in Romans 6, all the way to the end of chapter 6 and verse 23, Paul leaned into the idea that Christ has set us free from death. And in our freedom from sin, we're not to use the freedom to sin. That's the whole point of Romans chapter 6. Don't abuse grace, but rightly celebrate and live in light of grace. You notice in all of chapter 6, he never quite returned to what does it mean that we're no longer under the law? What's that all about? 
enter Romans 7, verse 1. He now returns to the idea of what it means for the Christian to no longer be under the law, to be set free from the law, what that freedom looks like, what it leads to, and what it bears within us. That's where he's at in chapter 7, what he's all about. So, if you received a bookmark on the way in, those of you watching at home, it was, it's on our loop to keep you in the loop. The outline's right here. Paul is very logical in what he does, very systematic in his descriptions and explanations of things. In verse 1, he'll state a truth. In verse 2 and 3, he'll illustrate that truth. And then like the master teacher he is, in verse 4 to 6, he will apply that truth. Very simple outline. Peculiar passage, we'll see, but potent in its resurrection meaning. So see first, truth stated. Verse 1. Or do you not know, brothers, for I'm speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives? How like Paul is this question? We've heard it before, time after time. Most recently, chapter 6, verse 3, and chapter 6, verse 16. Do you not know? That's a way of saying, I'm not saying anything new. What I'm about to say, you already know. That's what he's saying as he begins. Then he clarifies who he's talking to at the rest of verse 1. For I am speaking to those who know the law. The law. What law? Well, back in chapter 14, when we were there a few weeks ago, we said this is the law, referring to the first five books of the Bible, the books Moses wrote, that Jews summarize with the label, the law. So let's just keep that forward and say this is the same law here. That's to be consistent in our interpretation. But some people say, and some of your study Bibles, if you look down right now and look at the notes here, some will say Paul's clearly only talking to Jews here. Jewish believers who have a Jewish background but then came to embrace the Messiah as we ought to. Clearly he's talking to them because he's talking to those who know the law. I disagree. I don't think he's talking to Jewish believers here. I think he's talking to everyone here, both the Jew and the Gentile who have now believed in Jesus. Why? Remember, this is Paul's letter to the Romans, a largely Gentile congregation or non-Jewish people. Now, these Gentiles have embraced Jesus By faith, they've grown in their knowledge of God through the Scriptures, and so they have a knowledge of the law. Clearly not as much as the Jew does, though, about the law. And so for them, perhaps there's lingering questions. Paul, I know you said that we're no longer under law. Well, what does the law have to do with us? Sure, we're free from it, but does it still have a place for us? These are the things that Paul will tease out through the entirety of Romans 7. But he begins by just stating the truth generally in the rest of verse 1. The law binds a person only while they live. Do you hear the opposite that's implied? If the law only binds a person while they live, the way to be unbound from the law, to be severed, that the law can be dissolved in its authority over us, is by death. While we live, we're bound to it. Death can sever us from it. But then perhaps you then hear the, your feeling, maybe the question that comes from that. Well, goodness, Paul, If I'm bound to the law while I live, and the only thing that can sever me from the law is death, how am I to enjoy the freedom that comes from being no longer bound to the law if I'm dead? Well, thankfully, Paul doesn't only state the truth 
in verse 1, but then he moves on to our next heading and he illustrates the truth in verse 2 and 3. Look at what he says next. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. What's this got to do with Easter? We'll get there. So the truth he stated in verse 1, he now illustrates in verse 2 and 3. But do you, do you kind of wonder why he chose this illustration? I mean, he wants to illustrate and describe and display for his auditors and uh, his, his hearers, original audience and us today, what verse one's all about. And then he goes to marriage, the relationship between a husband and wife, and death. Okay. Did this just pop up in the mind of Paul as he's writing? Some people think that. I don't. I think there's more purpose in Paul's choosing this particular illustration to make a point. He wants to show us that if we look at the relationship between a husband and a wife in marriage and what happens to that covenantal bond at death, we get a window into what happens between the sinner and God's law before we're saved and converted, and after we're saved and converted. That's why he uses the illustration. So let's, let's lean into this and see it for ourselves. Verse 2 begins somewhat generally, a woman is bound to her husband by law while he lives. But if the husband dies, she is no longer bound, but free. So, Aaron and Christiany, Sorry to put you on the spot here. You're also in the second row, so you're right here in front. But, Lord willing, Friday will come. And part of the vows that you'll say, usually, I think 99.99999% of weddings will have the phrase, till death do us part. Have you ever wondered why? This passage is the prime reason why. Because death truly is something that severs the bond that you two will enter into. But, I, I don't want to discourage you. That, that's, that's kind of somber. There's, Lord willing, a lot of life. <laughs> Let's just move on. Let's just move on. <laughs> Verse 3 continues on the illustration. By pointing out that the woman would be an adulterer if she were to live with another man while her husband is alive. Only the husband's death brings freedom to marry another man. That's the illustration in verse 2 and 3. Now before we kind of tease some of this out, I feel like I have to make a qualifier here. Some people take verse 2 and 3 as the definitive passage in the Bible that describes marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Only death can sever the bond. That's a view you can have of marriage. It's not a view we have here of marriage. Why? Because there are many other parts of Scripture that say there are a few other things that can sever this bond as well. Think Paul's discussion of what abandonment looks like in 1 Corinthians 7. Jesus' words on adultery in Matthew 5. Then you couple in this death and you got three, only three reasons that can dissolve a marriage. So let's not press this text into doing something that it was never intended to do. Okay, so back to the illustration. How does this illustration in verse 2 and 3 help us understand verse 1? That's the big question, right? 
So how does that happen? Well, I think it happens like this. Just as a married woman is bound to and under the authority of her husband, so to all mankind from birth is bound to and under the authority of God's law. But we can go further. Death breaks the bond of marriage. It severs it. It dissolves it. So while the woman was once bound to her husband upon his death, she becomes free. And then it's implied that there is a way to be free as a sinner from the law of God. And the only way to be free of it is by death. But we can go further. Once the husband is dead, the wife, former wife, is free to enter into a new covenant and make a new bond, enter into a new relationship. So too, you see what's implied there. If death is going to sever the bond between the sinner and God's law, Death's the only way to dissolve that bond. Somehow, that sinner is then free to enter into a new bond. But to explain that further would bring us to verse 4. So let's go there. That's the illustration that Paul gives in verse 2 and 3 to explain verse 1. But thankfully, he doesn't just state the truth. He doesn't just illustrate it. He now applies the truth to us. This is where something of our Easter comes in view. Truth applied. Let's just start at verse 4. Likewise, my brothers, you have also died through, sorry, died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. So when we come to verse 4, we understand why Paul gave the illustration he did in verse 2 and 3. Why then he used that illustration to explain verse 1. He did so because he wanted to show not only what we once were, but now by God's grace what we are. We were once bound to the law of God, but a death has indeed occurred. Notice how he kind of turns it on its head here. A death has occurred, but is it the death of a spouse? No. We have died. Do you see that in verse 4? You have also died to the law, but there's more about this death. You have also died to the law through the body of Christ. And so we're back again at where Romans 6 taught us again and again and again, when we believe in Jesus, we're made one with Jesus. We're united to Jesus. And in this union, it's so intimate and so close and so deep that somehow there's mystery here. Spiritually speaking, Jesus' death in His body on the cross, becomes our death in His body on the cross. And so there truly is a death that severs us from the law. Remember, death severs and uh, dissolves bonds formerly made. So here in verse 4, we see we have died to the law. And in the freedom that death brings, we sinners are now free to enter into a new bond and a new relationship, a new covenant. A new relationship, bond, and covenant with who? To Him who has been raised from the dead. We have now arrived at Easter. We were once married to the law of God, but in Christ we have died And now free from the law, we're free to belong to Him who has been raised. Why? For what? To bear fruit for God. Curious. 
I, when, when I read that, I want to ask a question. What fruit, bear fruit for God, what does this fruit smell like? Do you ever just have strange questions like that when you're reading a text? Is it just me? It's just me? All right, cool. Well, let's lean into this weirdness for a little bit. In The Hobbit, when... Hang in! All of you who don't read it, just ignore everything that's going to be said right now. Whatever. So, in The Hobbit, right as Bilbo gets on his unexpected adventure, they get attacked by goblins and orcs, and Gandalf takes them on a side route to Rivendell. The last homely house, the eastern side of the mountains. And as they're coming into the valley, they all see Elrond's house, that's Rivendell. And Bilbo makes such a strange comment. It's, it's just so quick that if you're not paying attention, you just go right over it. Bilbo says, hmm, Rivendell. It smells like elves. And I remember reading that the first time I read The Hobbit going, What do elves smell like? There's nothing ever written to describe what they smell like. It's one of those little nuggets. You're just like, it's never going to be answered. All that to say, when I got here to bear fruit for God, what, what does this fruit smell like? It smells like resurrection. It smells like life to life, to those who believe. A resurrected Savior gives His Spirit to His people, those who believe, and His Spirit then bears resurrection fruit in them and through them. This fruit smells like life. Or perhaps we could put it like this. We, men and women, once bound to the law of God and dead in sin, perhaps you think of Galatians 4, for at the proper time Christ came, born, we're bound to the law, right? At the right time Christ came, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. There's a reason why Paul says what he does. So, in case we've, we've just missed the point here, Paul repeats everything that he's going to say, or everything he has said in verse 1 to 4, in verse 5 and 6, and then adds to it. This is Paul's way. He'll state something, illustrate it, explain it, and then restate it all again and expand on it. You've got to love such a mind. Look at verse 5. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions, aroused by the law, were at work in our members to what? Bear fruit for death. We know what that smells like. Like six-week-old bananas you've forgotten about on the top of the fridge. You grab it and it just disintegrates and oozes all in your hand. And it's nasty and it's rotten and it smells like death. This is what we once were. He's saying, but then look at verse 6, but now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, curious, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. So to bring all this to something of a summary here, married to the law, the law was our old husband that we never have to fear. He was an abusive husband that abused us in every single way possible. The law, all it does is call out sin and expose sin and tell us where we have failed before God. Lord willing, next Sunday in verse 7 to 12, we're going to lean into that because that's the question. Well, what then the law? The law was given that sin would be seen as exceedingly sinful. That's what the old husband does. But the believer need not fear the old husband because we have a new husband. Is that strange to think about? You already have a husband, Christine. Sorry, Aaron. 
It's weird, but you know, so do you, Aaron. We all do. We already have a husband, a husband who is not only faithful to God's law, but truly fulfilled every single one of its requirements, but then bore the curse of a lawbreaker in our behalf. And we are now married to him who has been raised from the dead. This is the Christian. This truth, Paul has stated, he has illustrated, and he has applied to it. And as he applies it, notice how he ends. We serve in the new way of the Spirit, not the old way of the written code. See the, see the comparison there? The old way, the law of God was external, written on tablets of stone. The new way is internal, written on the tablet of the human heart, meaning the Holy Spirit taking up residence in the heart of each believer so that their heart becomes Christ's home. And what does the Spirit then do? You've all seen HGTV, I'm sure. The Spirit is the true renovator and makes the home suitable for the Savior. Slowly, but surely. This is a truth that changes everything. So the no-brainer question that we need to end with is, Has this truth changed you? Or we could ask it in the way perhaps the text asks it, who is your husband? Is it the law? Are you still trying to work your way to God and obey your way to God by just doing doing enough good things in the right direction? God will know I'm not like the people in jail. I'm different. Or are you married to Him who has been raised from the dead and are banking in His work, His fulfilling of the law, His cross, and His resurrection to give you entrance into God? Or are you trying to do some kind of both and type thing, where you've been wed to Christ by faith, you've truly been saved, and you know Jesus, but you have an adulterous heart, and you go back to the world to glut your soul on sinful delicacies. This text and many others would say that's what adultery looks like. How could we go against such a Savior and husband Who bought us? To do so as a Christian is to act as if you're really still single, spiritually speaking. There is no Christian on planet earth who is not already spoken for. Why would you then act as if you're single? You have a husband, you're under his authority, you're bound to him. And he, praise God, is the greater Hosea who ever chases and pursues his wayward bride. So perhaps think of that moment, the end of the week, when the doors open in the back of the church and there's the bride. Does anyone in that moment look at the groom? No. Except perhaps maybe the mother of the groom because that bride's just not good enough. All you moms are like, amen. (laughs) But then eventually, when the bride gets halfway down, most people eventually do, are curious enough to want to see the groom's face. And I've had the privilege of standing up there with so many brides and grooms on that day when their new family is created and some of them just get the biggest, goofiest smile on their face. They don't care who's looking. 
They are beyond thrilled in that moment. Some of them cannot keep it together and there needs to be like a bucket under their face because it's just leaking from every hole. Because they're so happy, it's just all the water in them is coming out of their face. But think of the great day at the great marriage supper of the Lamb when we will physically what is now true of us spiritually we are already wed to christ at that moment we will be physically wed to christ at that union and go off forever with him into eternity and glory at that moment no one in the hosts of heaven will be looking at the bride not even the bride one another will we be looking at the bride. We will all be looking at the face of the groom and we will be stunned that there is only one person looking at the bride because He loves her so much. The Lord Jesus, who bought the groom, brought the bride with His own precious blood. So church, know this. In an ancient arid city, one singular event occurred. Unleashing a movement so compelling, so enduring, so influential, so unstoppable, that 2,000 years and billions of followers later, it's still growing faster than ever. While the mighty empire that witnessed its birth now lays in ruins. This movement has shaped nations, spanned oceans, birthed universities, launched hospitals, transformed tribal peoples in the most remote corners of the world, and is now spoken, read, and sung about in more languages than any other movement on the planet. What is that singular event that changed everything? Jesus walked out of his grave. Love it or hate it, The world has never seen anything like it. Some of you don't believe this. I'm not unaware of you here today. I was once a Christer as well. One who attends church only on Christmas and Easter. My name is Adam. I'm a recovering Christer. Hi. 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 I'd like to take a moment to speak just to you, since perhaps you won't visit much after this. I pray you do. We're open year round. You know that. (laughs) It's in our name. It's Easter every Sunday at sunrise. But I do wonder if you believe this. Or maybe you feel like it's just got to be lip service obligation. I have to go to church on Easter. It's what you do. Do you believe in the resurrection? Or do you think it's just a fanciful tale created by Jesus' followers that used it then to create a religion while Jesus was all about love and really Christianity comes from Paul. It's all just a bunch of rules from him. Jesus never intended this to happen. Do you believe that? Here's what I would ask of you. Think on the resurrection honestly. Think on it thoughtfully and just try to answer one question. Did Jesus really walk out of the tomb? The more you lean into this, the more you see the skeptical, critical bent against this, the more you see we are convinced of how short those answers fall. And that in the end, every single objection against the resurrection lands flat because it's a historical, objective reality that really happened. And so having arrived at that conclusion, take it one step further. Since Jesus did walk out of the tomb, look at his teaching. His teaching must be true if he is really 
the resurrected king of the world, and if his teaching is true, everything about my life has to change. Because it means one day, whether with my whole heart gladly, I will say all hail King Jesus, or against my wishes, I will be forced to bow the knee to the king I rejected and ignored in life. We will all meet him one day. If he walked out of the tomb, what he taught was true. And if what he taught was true is true, everything must change. The empty tomb, after all these years even, is more influential than ever. It refuses to leave the stage of world attention. And so I just ask you to do this, to ponder The words of the angel. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you came forth from the grave as the victor. Conqueror of death and hell and all opposition. Bursting the bands of death. Trampling down the powers of darkness to live forever. Lord, help those that are present who reject this. Lord, I I was once among them. I know the cost of what it feels to have to change everything. But Lord, by Your grace, Lord, help them. Help them see the truth and be so stunned by Your beauty that they want to do this. Lord, so give assurance that in Christ we die. That in Him we rise. That in His life we live. In His victory we are victorious. And that one day with Him, Lord, we shall be glorified. Lord, You know our hearts. Come and work, we pray. That this would not just be a day about eggs or bunnies, but a day about you and your resurrection might and the smell of life to life. May such fruit, may such aroma be not only present here in all these churches of this city, but growing and flourishing. For your fame, we ask this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.